Hello, everybody, and welcome to Heart of the Matter from Partnership to End Addiction. I am your host, Elizabeth Vargas, and I hope you are having a fabulous June. You know, when I got sober, um, I remember a lot of people, we would all talk about, oh, my business, you know, drug and alcohol, you know, use disorder is rampant in my business. And we all said that, whether we were journalists on network television or lawyers or brokers and day traders. But it turns out, get this, that the highest rate of at least drug use, illicit drug use in any business happens, guess where? In restaurants, in the food service industry. And by the way, it's the one business where when you go back to work, you're continually surrounded by alcohol. If you're tempted by alcohol or drugs, they're everywhere um, in the food service industry. So today we're going to talk to Chef Gregory Gourdet. You may remember him. He was uh, on Top Chef for several years. He was a Top Chef finalist twice. He was an all-star and guest judge. It's a hugely successful show. I know my kids watch it and love it. He's also been named Chef of the Year by Eater and one of the fittest chefs in America by Men's Health. But that only happened after he got sober. He says he lost seven years of his life to drug and alcohol use disorder uh, before he finally got sober, as he put it, in the parking lot of an Ikea. That was where his moment of clarity was. It's an interesting story. He's got a new book coming out called Everyone's Table, where he uses all sorts of, you know, his Haitian upbringing, his training by Jean-Georges in Manhattan, to come up with some fabulous recipes, but it's probably the only cookbook or one of the few that you'll read where there's a lot of space devoted to getting sober, at least at the very beginning. It's very inspiring. Gregory Gourdet, in fact, is inspiring and has an incredible story. And I think you're gonna enjoy hearing from him. So here is Chef Gregory Gourdet. Gregory, welcome. Great to have you here. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I wish we were doing this in person over food that you had prepared <laughs> <laughs> because I took a look at your new cookbook and wow, does it look amazing. Oh, thank uh, you so much. So listen, I was doing some research um, in advance of this podcast and I was really struck by a statistic that according to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the rates of illicit drug use found in the accommodations and food services industry is the highest of any industry, mm. nearly 17%, whereas mm -hmm. for all other industries, it's an average of just under 10%. Mm -hmm. Why is it so high, do you think, in the food well, industry? Yeah. I mean, I'm 100% a product of that environment. You know, my troubles with addiction definitely started when I was cooking, you know, mm. and I think a lot of it stems from just the hours, working at night, it's a high pressure situation, and the reaction to that is to go out and to celebrate, you know, a successful evening, you're always working with a group of other people, and you're getting off work late at night. I started my, my career in New York City, the bars were open till 4am, uh, you could go clubbing till, you know, for days if you wanted to, literally. Right. So, you know, it just became going to the bar to celebrate a successful evening of service after working for 12 hours a day, you know, pushing yourself, working in a very high pressure situation with very expensive ingredients. And that kind of took over when you have so many resources for addiction, you know, like <laughs> so many bars to go to. Drugs are easily accessible. Uh, you, you have carte blanche, you know, and you, you're allowed to in any establishment or club or bar um, because of your connections, you know, it just becomes very, very easy to, to succumb to that lifestyle. I remember years, it's decades ago, actually, I dated a chef here in New York City who had several restaurants. And after all the restaurants would close, all these chefs would, you know, gather at Blue Ribbon downtown oh, yeah. at 2 okay. a.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, sit at a table together and, yeah. you know, eat these amazing meals and drink all this alcohol until 5 a.m. Yeah, yeah, New York's trouble. <laughs> it's part of the lifestyle, isn't it? It, 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 it has been, it, it, it was, you know, that's definitely changing, but it's 100% my story. I was starting my training, like, at the turn of the century, the early aughts, you know, so 
It was New York City. It was a heyday for sure. It was the end of an era for sure. The first thing we did after work was go to the bar and, and there was many of us and we met up with people from other restaurants as well, you know, so we'd be like 12, 15, 20 people deep, like at bars and at bigger bars and at clubs and we'd leave the the bar at, at four and, you know, which is ridiculous, you know, that's, mm-hmm. I can't imagine staying that late anymore, uh, especially in the pandemic world, but you know, then, you know, New York City, you know, you could go to the club and we'd go to the clubs at 6 a.m. clubbing all day, you know, and, and you don't do that sober. Uh, I mean, I could probably do that sober now, uh, but back then it was definitely a drug-fueled event. You know, I think there's also, there also historically has been the culture of shift drinks, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it's it's literally being rewarded for doing your work with alcohol. What does that mean, shift, like at the end of your shift? Like at the end of your shift, you know, um, a lot of restaurants historically have had when you finish your shift, you go, you sit at the bar, everyone gets a beer or a shot, and that's how you end your night. So I don't know a lot of other professions that celebrate you doing your job with alcohol. Right. Oh, that's right. It's a good point. Yeah. So, you know, there, there have been some some systems in place um, to kind of build a sense of the color industry is very problematic in that it's very um, easy to become addicted to drugs and alcohol when working. One sober chef, a fellow sober chef, Sean Brock, actually said that both alcoholism and workaholism were rampant problems in your industry and were actually both rewarded. In other words, working those long, intense hours and going out and drinking a lot seemed to be rewarded, according to him. Did you find that to be the case? Um, 100%. Uh, I, I personally don't feel I was forced to work a lot by any means, you know, um, but I am definitely still a workaholic. Um, That is just a part of my personality. And, you know, I think having an addictive personality that leads to that. Um, Also having my parents be my mentors and role models, and they literally worked two jobs, three jobs their entire lives until they retired. So like that is the example of what I have in my head of how you need to work, you know, especially, you know, as immigrants who came to this country to raise a family mm. um, and find success, you know. So for me, you know, it really was about having to come in early to get your job done. And I, I worked off the clock, you know, because I wanted to, or, you know, I really wanted to just get my job done. Um, and I actually enjoyed that pressure. I think it's different for everyone. Um, but I enjoyed working that much, you know, um, but it did lead to the reaction of, you know, after doing all this all day and, and going to work and working off the clock for, you know, four hours just to get everything done um, and having a great successful night, I'm going to go party my ass off. Um, right. That's really what led to my issues with addiction because I don't have any addiction in my family whatsoever. So it's really something that I put upon myself and gave myself. You mentioned you don't have addiction in your family. You are uh, a child of Haitian immigrants, as you said, a typical immigrant family that comes and works really, really hard to achieve the American dream, not just for themselves, but for Mm -hmm. their children. Um, You went to the Culinary Institute of America. It's an extremely prestigious cooking school. Mm -hmm. And then unbelievably, right after graduating, you went to work for Jean-Georges. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hello. In fact, d- which you were at the Jean Georges restaurant in the in the Trump Towers on Central Park West, right? Trump Hotel, yeah. I, like- I've eaten there a zillion times. Probably you were there yeah. um, as well. It's an amazing restaurant. Um, at what point did you feel like your drinking began? to be problematic i mean or for a while were you drinking just like everybody else in the kitchen sure i mean my story of addiction starts fairly early with recreational drug use you know i went to a small boarding school in delaware um i grew up in queens very traditional haitian household my parents were very very prim and proper uh, very respectable people we went to church on sundays i went to catholic school Uh, But when I was introduced to boarding school and, you know, kids from different parts of the country, um, definitely more white people than I grew up with and from tons of different backgrounds. Um, But, you know, recreational drug use started pretty early. Um, You know, I I remember doing like acid in high school and, you know, the first time. And it was all very recreational. Um, I did get suspended from high school for like, like whole drug incident. So that was kind of like a little peek (laughs) into what could happen, you know, and uh, my parents are extremely concerned, uh, but 
you know, I just kept moving forward. I kept working. I kept going to school. I went to college. I started cooking when I went to college in Montana. Again, a lot more recreational drug use, you know, and at the, in the nineties, it was rave culture. That was a really big part of kind of global party culture. Mm-hmm. Listen, you know, um, throwing raves, um, lots of designer drugs. And as I got a little bit older and I settled down and I started working in New York city, I specifically remember the first time I was late for work. And I really marked that day as like the beginning of the seven year um, addiction issue that I had with drugs and alcohol. I had to close service one evening and I had to be back early the next morning to work brunch. It's called the clopen. Um, it's mm-hmm. a ordinary term where, you know, you close and you have to open. So you have a very, very short window to get home and get some sleep and get back to work. And I told chef I was not going out. I was going straight to bed. And on my way home, I took a quick detour. Um, I was out and I partying. Um, and I woke up the next morning late for work. I was uh, asleep on my friend's couch. Um, and I walked into work and chef was working my station um, on the line. And he was extremely upset. And that was the first time I was ever late for work. And that was the first time of many, many times for seven years that I was very late for work. And I really marked that day as the first day um, of the this, this seven-year battle I had with drugs and alcohol. Um, and, you know, that really was a bottom for me. Uh, I checked into rehab upon my last days in New York City. Um, I finally told my parents that I had a problem with alcohol and cocaine, um, but I got an opportunity to move to California. So I, I dipped out of rehab and I moved out west. And it took another two years um, and moving to California and then finally moving to Portland, Oregon um, to finally get sober. Yeah, you pulled what we call in recovery a couple geographics. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you you actually write in the foreword to your brand new cookbook, Everyone's Table, seeking change or escape, I moved to San Diego and joined a gym. I would stop drinking for a few weeks in an attempt to keep the demons at bay and to keep them secret from my new community, only to relapse spectacularly. Indeed, indeed. You know, I, I remember I moved to California and... I was two weeks into rehab. I jumped out of rehab. I left. And like within minutes of landing in LA, I was, you know, doing cocaine with some friends. And we drove down to San Diego where I was supposed to start my new job. And I think I lasted for about a month, you know, of not drinking. I was like, hey, I'm going to be a good person. Like, Mm -hmm. and I think it was Halloween. And I just got absolutely blacked out drunk. And everyone was just like extremely shocked with my behavior because that wasn't how I was acting for like about a month. And that really kind of opened the can of worms for that, you know, my time in San Diego, which was a huge mess. Um, I got in a really bad car accident after drinking for 12 hours on New Year's Eve. Um, I was arrested immediately after, you know, they took me immediately to the hospital because I, I flipped and totaled the car. I was immediately taken to the hospital. Um, I, they realized nothing happened to me. I, I had like a tiny scratch above my eye. They couldn't believe it. And I was taken, I was arrested. And I got even arrested one more time during my time there. Um, so it was very, very messy. Um, and without the drugs in New York City, you know, the drinking became truly a big problem. And I think that's really when my alcoholism really came into play, when the drugs were taken away. And yeah, I mean, it took moving to Portland, Oregon, and I accepted a job at a, a cafe here. And I walked in and this, I was the, going to be the sh- executive chef and my sous chef. He introduced himself, and the first thing he said was, hey, you know, my name is Tom, and I haven't drank in two years. And it was really the first time I had ever met someone who had who was in recovery, who had said that they hadn't drank in numerous years. And for me, I couldn't fathom such a thing. So I would literally go and get drunk every night, and I would actually go and hang out with his group of sober chef friends. And we'd hmm. hang out, and we'd, like, smoke cigarettes and just chill out and eat, and then I'd go to the bar and start drinking. And it was really one of the first pivotal moments in my life that made me think about a sober lifestyle. And I started looking around and I was entering my early 30s and all my friends from college who were living here, they had homes, they, you know, they had children and I was like getting drunk and falling off my bike. And like, I just knew I had to get myself together. And, you know, after moving around and and doing this and that and so many jobs, I just, I took a deep look inside myself. Um, and I had a really long conversation with a really good older friend of mine from, from college and he had been in recovery for a few years as well. Um, so, cause, because it truly is about community. Um, and I asked for help, you know, I stayed up all night one night and I, I met him and it was, you know, the last night I ever drank and I did drugs. And I thought long and deep if I was really ready to 
never do drugs and alcohol again? And I asked myself that question and I told myself that the answer was yes. And um, I walked into an AA meeting um, pretty shortly after that. Um, and that was, you know, 12 years ago and I haven't looked back. Wow. What do you think it was? I mean, that, you know, we call it that moment of clarity that some some people call it a God shot. Um, you know, whatever you, however you choose to see it, 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 it something happened. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't after, you know, your car accident. And in fact, you write in your book <clears throat> about that, New Year's Eve, you know, car accident and arrest, Mm -hmm. you write, in a movie about an addict, this would be the moment that changed everything, when the protagonist checks himself into rehab and emerges a new man. But this isn't a movie. A couple of weeks later, I was blackout drunk again. Six months after that, I was back on cocaine. It took another year for me to quit drinking and doing drugs. There was no humiliation or accident or tearful conversation with a friend. I'd already had so many of those. Instead, it was a day like any other, except it wasn't. It was a day that you looked yourself in the mirror and said, no more. Indeed. Indeed. You know, I think we all get to that point. You know, that's why so many of us are in recovery and so many of us are able to reclaim our lives and move forward. And it happens for different reasons. Sometimes it happens at our bottom. And I really felt that time in New York City was really, truly my bottom. Um, But even my bottom wasn't the end of it for me, you know, because, you know, my bottom led me to enter rehab, but I truly didn't have an understanding of what recovery was. You know, I was drinking in rehab. I was doing coke in rehabs, you know, my- How were you doing that? Uh, I I was just like sneaking by. I think we only got like, it was outpatient. So- Okay. Yeah. Um, It was definitely sketchy, Um, but it just proved that I didn't really understand what was going on, you know, because just understanding that you have a problem with drugs and alcohol may be very apparent, but understanding how to get sober and wanting to get sober is two different things. Because mm. even my friends who insisted I go to rehab, who wouldn't talk to me, who wouldn't work with me unless I was in rehab, we would have conversations and they would be like, you should be able to drink like a normal person. You know, so the understanding was I would go to rehab and I would just be able to do drugs and drink like, like everybody else again. You know, and uh, that's just not how it works. great lie we all tell you ourselves. Know? And that's just not how it works, you know. So, yeah. so it definitely took, you know, spending time with alcoholics, you know, meeting alcoholics, getting advice from alcoholics, um, and really looking at my life. And, you know, I reached a point where I, I physically felt I could not drink, I could not do drugs, and I could not smoke cigarettes. Physically, I felt like I couldn't do it anymore. And that Did was really Did you quit the tr- all three at once? All three at once. <laughs> oh, my God. How did you do that? I just, I just did, you know, it just, it just all fell into the same box of things for me. And, you know, like alcohol led to me wanting to do drugs and smoking cigarettes, you know, you know, made me think about all those things as well. You know, it was just all the package and I, I, I physically couldn't, luckily I, I physically felt like I couldn't smoke cigarettes anymore. And, and I know how hard it is to quit smoking cigarettes. I smoked cigarettes for 17 years. So I'm very, very relieved that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm relieved from that as well. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it, it just took some deep soul searching and, you know, getting older and looking around at, you know, what people in the world are doing and what my life is like and realizing that I wanted more and I deserve more and I could, I could achieve more. Um, and I'm extremely grateful that I was, I am in recovery, you know? You're in one. <clears throat> you're in one of the rare fields where, even though um, you're working, there is alcohol everywhere around you. Um, you know, most people don't go to an office surrounded by people drinking, um, and yet that's your office, which is the restaurant, is surrounded by people drinking. Mm-hmm. Not just the customers, mm-hmm. some of the staff. How is it? I mean, I'm really curious about that early sobriety, but even yeah. now, I mean, does it ever? look good to you again? Yeah. How do you resist that temptation when everybody else all around you is indulging it? Sure. You know, I think for me, you know, I, I've i been relieved of the desire to drink. And I think that's something I'm extremely grateful for because I know everyone's recovery is different. You know, I know people who have 30 years of sobriety who are uncomfortable walking into a bar. Um, for me, you know, as being someone, you know, I, I even like the first, you know, I think even in the beginning, you know, I thought I was like getting sober, I would still taste drinks 
at work, mm. you know, and, and someone called me out and like, you can't, you can't like for taste a drink. Like, what are you doing? Like, just because you want to taste the happy hour cocktail, like you can't do that just because you're the chef. And I was like, you're absolutely right. You know? So like I, it, it even took a little more time to like really dial in what, like what recovery meant to me. Um, but you know, for me, uh, well, the first thing I did, I, I stopped going to bars for six months, you know, like within that first year, I, I just, you know, I would go running, you know, I started running and I would literally go run at night. I would get off of work. Um, I would go running at night, you know, and I would. That's the middle of the night, Gregory. <laughs> I mean, yeah. when you yeah. get off work, it's late. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was training for, you know, my first marathon. So, you know, my first half marathon, I immediately set my goals. I was training for my first half marathon. As soon as I did my first half marathon, I hired a coach from Nike and I started training for my first marathon. And I would just run around like I would, everyone would get off of work, you know, people would go to the bar and I would just start running, you know. So that was one way to kind of just immediately change my habit you know, and, and, and do something exactly opposite than, than what I used to do, you know, but I think for me, uh, you know, I just wanted to get sober to be able to do the things that I still enjoy and do the things that I still love. And, you know, I had to make a clear decision. I definitely had to pick up some new habits and I, I took up eating healthier, which, you know, which leads us to the book and, and, and going to the gym and, and being healthy. And I live somewhere, you know, like Oregon, which is an absolutely stunning state to be outdoors. And, you know, I was taking advantage of being outdoors after living in New York City for the past nine years. So there was so many amazing things that happened, you know, and just trying to figure out, you know, like taking a break from going to the bars and all these things and, you know, just removing myself completely, you know, but I remember the first time I went back to New York City, you know, and I went to, you know, a bar or a, a club with, with my friends. And, you know, back then I would drink so much Red Bull. It was like awful. Um, but I was extremely nervous, you know, and, and, and extremely uncomfortable, um, and extremely shaky, I had tons of anxiety around it. Not that I wanted to drink, but I just was just so uncertain of like how I felt about these situations. With these statistics about substance use disorder in your industry and stories like Anthony Bourdain, you know, who wrote about drug and alcohol use in his, uh, memoir, Kitchen Confidential, and then of course committed suicide um, because of mental health issues. There's been a lot of focus on um, people, chefs in the business, um, the pressure, the substance use disorder. Um, you now lead a group, a recovery group of recovering um, chefs. How important has that been to your recovery? Uh, I mean, it's, it's absolutely extremely important. You know, I think I think our industry as a whole has uh, been in quite a transitional phase for quite a few years. You know, I think you know maybe maybe four four or five years ago we started seeing more focus on you know mental health in the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, I think. I think with the younger workforce, the new generation, which is a completely generation, complete different generation than mine, um, I think we as chefs had to start to reevaluate, you know, what kitchen culture really was, um, and how we were trained, and you know how our upbringing, you know, impacted our leadership, and how the younger generation. Um, really reacted to, you know, and, and how the younger generation, you know, needed to be treated. Um, because, you know, we, we you know, we, like we, we, talk, we talked about, you know, we worked off the clock, you know, it was high pressure, you know, I wanted to work off the clock, you know, like all these things are, it's just very different today, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, like I would go and drink and do drugs with my chefs, you know, like, you know, like all these things are absolutely like not okay, you know, <laughs> in the modern world. You know, so, you know, I, I think it, it started with, you know, like the Sober Chef movement, which kind of popped up. I think about five years ago, we started seeing, you know, I did, you know, one of the first Sober Chefs dinner at a food festival. We did that for Feast Portland a few years ago. And it was, you know, with Andrew Zimmern and Sean Brock and Gabriel Rucker and, and Mike. That is so cool. Yeah. You know, like that was really great. And, and, and you know, through that, Ben's friends, um, which is the recovery group for the industry members that I'm in, you know, um, Ben's friends um, had been a couple years old at that time. Um, and really it's just, uh, it's, it's not an AA meeting, um, but it's very AA adjacent. You know, a lot of us have gotten sober through AA. Most of us have, mm -hmm. um, who are mm -hmm. part of Ben's friends. So, you know, it's just an open meeting. It's an open conversation. 
and you know for all industry people you know because this disease impacts us pretty profoundly um and we have you know daily meetings um and you know with the pandemic we've been able to go virtual um but we have meetings in every city we have we have national meetings once a day so um it's been able to connect you know tons of people in the industry from you know bartenders and and winemakers who have gone sober and are questioning you know how they you know how does a winemaker stay sober? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean just, I'm just <laughs> one day at a time, like the rest of us, you know, <laughs> um, but it's, it's like offering a, a safe space, you know, because, you know, you know, maybe in a name meeting, you can't say that you're a bartender, you know, you can't mm -hmm. say that you're a winemaker and you're sober because you might get a raised eyebrow, but in Ben's friends, you can talk about these things because again, you know, if this is the industry that we love, this is what we want to do for life. You know, we find ways as people who are in recovery to keep doing our job and keep, keep being passionate about the things that we enjoy. Many of our listeners may remember you from your stints on Top Chef. Mm -hmm. You were a contestant in season 12 Indeed. and then later on a judge. Indeed, indeed. Um, but you auditioned, you had auditioned how many times before they took I you? I auditioned twice. So I think I auditioned like, I mean, Top Chef has been on, we're on season 18 right now. So I think I auditioned for like season two or three. Um, and a few years after that, but I specifically remember <laughs> staying up, doing coke all night long, and then going to my audition. And gee, I wonder why they didn't take you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's it's a it's it's another one of those amazing. Uh, this guy is talking super fast. <laughs> full, circle, full circle stories of of how you know this recovery is truly a gift, and you know in recovery you can achieve a lot of things. So I'm really grateful. You have been named, in addition to all the other awards you have won for your cooking, you've also been named one of the fittest chefs in America <laughs> by Men's Health Magazine. Um, you not you, you when you quit drinking and doing drugs and quit smoking and then started running in the middle of the night and instead of going out and partying at, when you were done with your shift, that led you to compete in half marathons and then full marathons. How many marathons have you done? Oh man, I've I've. I mean, te like technical marathons, I've probably done maybe, I would probably say about 20, but in terms of running marathon di distance, um, because I, I have, I'm an ultra runner, um, I've, I've run more than 25 miles multiple times. I've probably done that distance about 50 times. Um, wow. Yeah, but I'll just go run 30 miles with my friends for fun. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit far less in the past few years. I will say that. I think I've I reached my heyday of running, but um, running is still um, extremely important to me. It's it's a healthy habit that you were able to really, you know, pull a switch for the unhealthy. Yes, indeed. Elk. I mean, not everybody who gets sober is going to start running yeah, marathons. You don't, have to. you don't have to. Right. <laughs> yeah. But it did lead you to getting sober led you to do a complete rehaul of your entire life, not just the exercise, but in the yeah. way you eat yeah. and your relationship with, your, with food yourself. Indeed. You know, I, I think like running is like a pretty – straightforward metaphor for life it's putting one foot in front of the other it's, it's helping it also helps me kind of chop projects into pieces of time so like mm -hmm. mile markers kind of represent you know things that i need to do in, in a certain space of time um so like running has really helped me kind of just like be able to like deal with like huge life projects because i just take it one mile at a time um but you know um wanting to eat better um you know and seeing what works for my body and what doesn't and understanding that, you know, what you put into your body is extremely important if you wanted to perform um, after, you know, eating whatever I wanted for years and years, you know, as an addict. Um, and that's really what's led to the book and, you know, experimenting with the paleo diet and going to the CrossFit gym, you know, 10 years ago when those two went hand in hand um, and kind of just kind of figuring it out over the past decade and, you know, seeing what works for me, what doesn't and understanding that even though, Mother Nature makes all these foods that do have nutrients. Some actually aren't the best foods for you. And there are actually nutrients and vitamins far prominent in certain foods. And we should focus on those. And that's really the story behind the book. Um, it's being able to pick the best foods that Mother Nature makes, create them um, in a delicious and interesting way with global flavors, um, and eating it as much as that as you want and never feel like you're really on a diet. In this book, um... I'm curious in this lovely, gorgeous cookbook with recipes that I'm dying to try and make, but probably won't look like the ones that you have photographed in there because they never do. Um, 
why be so honest in this in the opening of this book about your battles with addiction? Why talk about that first AA meeting when you say, quote, I introduced myself as an alcoholic and addict, my voice breaking from the weight of hearing myself say those words aloud for the first time? I think in the modern world, um, I think being as vocal as possible about my recovery, about my addiction has been extremely important. I think on the foundations of AA, we are taught to be, you know, anonymous. Um, we are taught to, you know, just be respectful and, and not kind of promote um, or really talk too much about, you know, our, our issues and our struggles, you know, but, you know, being someone who's been given a national platform so many times and, and been asked about my story so many times, I just got more and more comfortable telling my story, um, you know, from being asked about it on Top Chef. And, you know, it's very uncomfortable to talk about these things, you know, especially if you're just a few years into recovery, you have so much shame, so much guilt about so many things that happened in the past, you know, you're not quite past it. So being able to, being asked to talk about it more and more, um, I got more comfortable with it, but also seeing what that effect is. You know, the first time I was on Top Chef, I was getting messages and comments and, you know, letters from people from all over the country who thanked me for being open about speaking about my recovery. And, you know, I even had chefs, you know, you know, getting into their fourth DUI and calling me and asking me what they should do. And, you know, mm -hmm. I specifically remember that specific moment with a chef friend of mine. And it truly was a time where I realized, you know, being as vocal as possible is actually helping people. And if I can, you know, help remove the stigma of being in recovery, if I can, you know, show people that, you know, by being vocal and, and, and honest and, you know, in carrying my badge of, you know, my addiction and recovery, um, it's actually really helpful for people to see that, you know, you can recover, you can thrive, you can be successful. And, you know, um, it's been extremely helpful. And, and that's to this day where, you know, more social media and, and everyone's on a national platform is just paying attention to what others are doing. You know, I still literally get weekly messages from people, you know, thanking for being open and honest about my recovery. Um, and I think that's something that's been very helpful for me as well. Right. You say that it was a friend that you had who was in AA who helped you get sober. I mean, it was that connection with somebody else who was willing to talk about their own sobriety. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I'm, you know, you've described a pretty, pretty dark existence during the, the seven years that you were, um, uh, you know, using drugs and alcohol. I know that when I was the end of my drinking, that was the loneliest I've ever felt in my entire life. Mm -hmm. And you know, I read a lot of books that other people wrote about, you know, getting sober. Mm -hmm. It, But it's that connection. Mm -hmm. It's actually, you know, hearing somebody else say, I, I suffered this exact thing and here's how I got better. Mm -hmm. That gives people hope mm -hmm. and starts to chip away at that stigma that is still so prevalent right now. Indeed, indeed. You know, I mean, you know, it's, I, I have to accept that this is part of my story. This is who I am and I'm far removed from that person. Um, you know, I like to say that I don't have regrets and I've learned from every experience and that if you can really truly learn from any experience, it was worthwhile. But the fact is I definitely have regrets, you know, like I definitely have family events that I missed. I definitely have things that I've told people that I regret saying, you know, but at the same time, again, all those experiences helped make me the sort of person that I am today. So I'm grateful for them. Um, but you know, it's, it, it takes a lot of looking into your, the mirror and as we talked about, just really being honest with yourself to stay sober um, and, you know, being vocal about what's happened to me, you know, it reminds me that I never want to be in that place ever again. Um, it reminds me of what I've had, what I have today. Um, and I never want to let that go. Um, and like I said, you know, I, I, I just want to be like that old timer in the meeting. <laughs> I want to be so for, <laughs> for a very long time, <laughs> you know, I'm being competitive with myself. Um, I just want lots of years of sobriety. You know, I think it's exciting. Um, and that's, that's a goal of mine to be sober, you know, for, you know, the rest of my life. And that's something that I work at every day. Yeah. Those anniversary meetings when somebody <laughs> sits, stands up and says they have 50 years and you're like, what? <laughs> there was a time when I couldn't imagine having 50 days yeah. sober. Yeah. So, oh, Gregory Gorday, thank you so much. Of course. Yeah, thank you. Um, the book is Everyone's Table.
It's uh, a beautiful book with recipes that aren't hard, mm -hmm. but sure look good. And um, they must taste good. Yeah, they're all God. designed for the home cook in mind. So they are step by step, full detail. Most of the book is ingredients that you can purchase year round. Um, there's uh, an, a handful in each chapter about really hyper seasonal ingredients. And I tell you which ones to use, um, where to shop for a global pantry. Um, but yeah, but they're definitely for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, any night of the week, you can find something to cook and it won't take you that long. Okay. Promise. promise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. You. Really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for listening today to Heart of the Matter. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on our website at drugfree.org slash podcast. And as a reminder, if you need help with a loved one who is struggling with substance use, you can text 55753 or visit drugfree.org. We'll talk to you soon.